while they're transitioning off, let me go ahead and invite our kids to head toward children's worship, our kindergartners through fifth graders. If you uh, would like to go to children's worship this morning, then Miss Allison and some other folks are over there at the door to meet you and to walk with you. If you have a kindergartner through fifth grader and maybe you're here for the first time or maybe they uh, are wanting to go but have never been and you'd like to walk over with them, you're always welcome to do that and then you can come back and join us. They'll get them transitioned in over there for uh, the children's message this morning. Uh, while they're making their way out, go ahead and pull out your Bibles uh, with me if you would and turn to Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. We're going to be uh, launching from Proverbs this morning. And if you know anything about Proverbs, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And, uh, and I have to go ahead and say that I claim wisdom this week. Uh, we had the food challenge, and what an awesome thing. The kids, uh, the kids brought in over 2,300, uh, I, I think Allison said, uh, food items for our food pantry. What an awesome, awesome thing. Let's give God a big hand for that, uh, for taking part in that ministry. Um, but part of, part of that challenge, I'm, just, I'm claiming wisdom, Aaron. Uh, this week we're in Proverbs, and I just want to challenge you to read the book of Proverbs. Um, because what we did, we said if, um, if the kids brought 300 cans, uh, that they could cut my hair on stage. I'd get a haircut on stage, and I'd have to get my hair cut like Aaron's. Well, that's, uh, you know, the Molly Cyrus type do. Um, but anyway, so... so the thing is, is I, I'm wiser than that. My hair's too short to look like his anyway, so I knew that wasn't going to quite happen. And really what happened is I ended up with the best haircut I've ever gotten, and I got it for free. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, and so Aaron said, well, if they bring a 1,000 cans, uh, I will uh, let them dye my hair pink. And so, Aaron, you ended up with pink hair. So there you go. Um, but we're in Proverbs and uh, we're going to look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. We're in this series called We Are Family. Maybe you're here for the first time, and we're, we're in our uh, fifth or sixth week in that, and we're stepping through uh, different aspects of family in the Bible, and this morning I want to talk about parenting. Uh, the title of the sermon is Parenting 101, and I'm certainly not standing up here claiming to be an expert. I fail at being a parent every day, believe you me, so we're constantly learning uh, about what it means to be a godly parent, to do it the way that God said to do it. And there's all kind of tips out there. There's all kind of suggestions, uh, and some of them are very good. I, I, one, of the, one of the best teachers or, or couples that teaches on parenting uh, is uh, Dennis and Barbara Rainey. They, t they lead a lot of Bible studies on family and parenting and childhood and all these things. And uh, they, they list uh, 40 lessons that God has taught them over the course of, of being parents and over the course of their ministry. And they listed off things uh, that, that raising children requires. And they said, above all, number one on the list of 40 is, above all, fear God. And I would agree with that. Amen? They said, respect, teach your children to respect authority, to trust and obey their parents. Teach your children the importance of friendships. Be in love with Christ and focus your relationship uh, focus on your relationship with him, not just on doctrine, not just on biblical principles, but let your kids see that you love Jesus Christ. Let them see it every day. Uh, teach them to have compassion for the poor and for orphans. Believe God for too much rather than too little. Shouldn't we teach our kids that? Teach them that real strength is found in serving, not in being served. Our kids need to learn that. Teach them the, the, the power of moral purity and a clean conscience. Teach them, uh, teach them how to motivate people without manipulating them. It's a big thing. How to handle failure. Our kids are going to fail. We fail all the time. Teach them how to handle failure. One of the biggest things they said was keep your promises. If you make a promise to your kid, make sure you keep it. Uh, the power of the tongue should be good, used for good, not for evil. Teach them to give too much rather than to give too little. Teach them the importance of manners and common courtesies. All right. View life through God's agenda, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Teach them to give thanks to God in all things, they said. Teach them, teach them the importance of prayer. Uh, teach them the art of asking good questions and carrying on good conversation. Boy, that's important in the day of, of technology, isn't it? Teach them how to grow as a Christian. Teach them how to handle temptation because it will come their way. By faith, trust Christ as your Savior and your Lord and share with others how to become a Christian. Teach them to seek wisdom. 
Gain a sense of God's direction and destiny for their lives. Stay teachable. Teach them to stay teachable and not become cynical. Teach them to obtain godly counsel. The list goes on. Tame selfishness. Teach them to learn character. Teach them that life isn't fair. Don't compare or be jealous of others. Teach them a strong work ethic. Teach them to surrender to the authority of Christ, that Christ is the ultimate authority in everything. Teach them, here's a good one, teach them how to handle their finances. All kind of tips. Uh, I read another one. It said, how to ruin your kid's life forever. Here it is. Give your kid everything he wants. Don't deny what will truly make him happy. Overvalue money and things in his eyes and you'll ruin his life. Secondly, dress your child in designer clothes no matter what the cost. Show her that her outward appearance matters more than who she is inside. Ruin her life by doing that. Place your child's needs over the needs of your spouse. If she cries, run to her immediately. If she interrupts, give her your full attention and ruin her. Number four, entertain your child throughout the day. Ruin her doing that. Number five, sign your child up for as many extracurricular activities as he or she desires and forget about church. Number seven, don't discipline your child when he acts up. Everyone should just learn to express himself in his own way. If he demands something, then applaud him for the efforts. At least you know that he'll not be a pushover or a doormat in this world when he grows up. Number eight, don't worry when your child fights with neighbor kids or even when he is a bully. Life's not fair and someone always has to be the underdog. At least your child's learning to elbow his way up to the top at a young age. When your child number nine has a disagreement with her teacher, always choose your child's side. Don't show up when the teacher wants to discuss your child's problems. The teacher will want to take a course of disciplinary action that will hurt your child's feelings. And number ten, don't share your faith with your child. After all, you don't want to offend. Let your child decide if she wants to hear Bible stories. Don't pressure him to memorize Scripture verses. He might get, dis might get disheartened. He doesn't get it right the first time, and he'll ruin his self-esteem. More than that, you don't want her to know that there's a God who runs the universe and who makes the rules and who determines eternity. The thought's too hard, and your child might not understand. More than that, she won't be self-dependent and strive to be a good person. Listen, kids understand. Kids can learn the gospel. The scripture, remember last week, we said that the Bible teaches us that we have to come to child, come to Christ as a child comes to God. We have to come to Christ just as a child would come to Christ. I mean, there's so many tips about how to be a good parent. And, they, and every one of those really has a biblical precedent. But I told you last week, the, really the beginning point is the Bible. And so Proverbs 22, verse 6, is really the launching point. I mean, if there's a verse about raising children in the Bible that people know, it's this one. Most famous verse about parenting in, in the Bible, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, let me just say that that verse is often quoted, and it's often misquoted. It's often mishandled because a lot of times people won't raise up a child in the way he should go. Maybe they brought him to church a little bit when they were growing up, or maybe a decision was made, but there was no training daily. There was no teaching of God's Word. And then people claim, well, he'll come back to it. Well, that's an assumption here because the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. It means that he's lived that out and that it's so important to him that he's not going to depart from it, not that he's going to come back to something that he gave away. And so we often misquote that scripture. And we're often wanting these instructions. I mean, train up a child in the way he should go. What is the way he should go? I mean, what, what is that? I mean, you know, it's, it's not like they hand out instruction manuals really at the hospital. I can remember when Jackson and Emma were born in 2002. And, and we, we had, and, and many of you have heard our, heard our story. We, we, we prayed for children and we couldn't have children. And then God... God blessed us, blessed us with twins, and, and it just an awesome, awesome thing. And, and I remember often when you have twins, often uh, the mom has to have a C-section, and that's what Sharon had to do. And so we have the babies, and, 
And, and the doctor said, do you want to hold your twins? And I'm just like, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And they hand me the twins, and they say, you want to go show your family? And I go show the family, the babies. And I come back, and they take the babies back, and they're cleaning up the babies, and they're doing all this. And then Sharon's still in surgery and all this, and, and it's all over. They have a shift change. The babies go to the nursery. A couple hours later, we're back in the room, and Sharon says, where are my babies? I haven't seen my babies. Two hours after they're born. Three hours go by. She hasn't seen the baby. I didn't know I was supposed to take her to the babies and let her see the babies. I didn't know. They didn't give me an instruction manual. I didn't know. I just did what the doctor said. And so four hours go by, and most of you know Sharon, and she's one of the sweetest ladies in all the world, but Mama was about to come out of the bed and hit a nurse. And so she was, I mean, she was about to go crazy. And so I go down to the nurse, and I said, look, we got a lunatic Mama down here going crazy. I said, she's going to come find her babies if you don't bring her babies. I mean, she needs to see the babies, and I, I, I was wishing I had an instruction manual that day, but we really do. We have an instruction manual for parenting, and right here it is. It, it's right here in God's Word, and we use Proverbs 22, verse 6 as a, as a springboard, and, and, and it's an interesting verse stuck right here in the middle of Proverbs because, like I talked about earlier before, the, before, the, uh, before I started, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. I mean, Proverbs tells us all these different things. It, t- it talks about God's judgment. It talks about how we should be generous. It talks about uh, how, how our speech should be, how we should use our bodies. It gives us insight about government. It does all these different things, but stuck right here in the middle of it, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. But then it doesn't tell us how to do that. So the how-tos are really in different parts of the Bible. The way a child should go is toward the gospel, because isn't that what the Bible is? The way a child should go is toward the gospel. So we see that the, the way that a child should go is not just toward moral living, our goal is, it's like this, our goal is not just to raise good children who behave and grow into to pretty good teenagers who just don't get into too much trouble, who grow into college students who just kind of hang on by a thread or maybe even depart from the church, but they're still pretty good people who grow into adults who have no gospel at all and are too busy and are too distracted for God. You see, the way a child should go is to come to a point where he or she embraces the gospel of Jesus Christ and sees that this is what they were created for and this is what life is all about and they are truly saved. So Proverbs invites us to wisdom, but when it's all said and done, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the gospel. In the end, we'll all give an account before Jesus Christ and what will really matter in life is whether or not we believe, whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Proverbs invites us to wisdom. When it's all said and done, wisdom is the gospel. In Proverbs, I believe Proverbs assumes the gospel here. Train up a child in the way he should go. The way he should go assumes the gospel. Train up a child in the gospel. And the good news in that is that a heart can be changed forever and healed forever by the gospel. That's the good news. A heart turned toward the gospel. That's what Proverbs is talking about. You see... Parents, our children need the gospel more than anything. They need a lot of things. They need a lot of things from you as a parent, but there's nothing they need more than the gospel. But we can't lead them to it if we don't have it ourselves. If the gospel is not the number one priority to us, then how is it ever going to be conveyed to our children? So the... The real need for children is not that they would grow, grow up and be wise and not that they would grow up and be practical livers, not just that they would get a good job one day, not that they would be successful and have a spouse and two kids and a, a nice house and a dog. I mean, those things are great. Nothing wrong with that. It's not, the, the ultimate goal is not that they be the star athlete or the cheerleader or the drum major or on student council. Those things are great, and God can use people in those things, and, and they should. But the real need is salvation. Our our kids, no matter how wise, no matter how moral, no matter how good, no matter how self-controlled, how successful, how disciplined, if their hearts have not been made new, if God has not forgiven their sins, then they will perish. No matter what college they go to or how many ball games they win, if your child does not know Jesus Christ, then we've missed the boat. That's why... That's why you see it in the gospel. You know, Paul told Timothy. Paul Paul gave an example of this to Timothy. I'm just going to give you some verses here. You can just jot them down, read them later. 2 Timothy 3.15. 
It's such an important principle. 2 Timothy 3.15 is what Proverbs is talking about here. Training a child in the way he should go. Here's what Paul said about Timothy. He said this to Timothy. Speaking of Timothy, he said, Timothy, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. That's pretty amazing. And the Scripture talks about that Timothy's mom and his grandmother taught him the Scriptures. And Paul noticed that. He said, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what Proverbs is talking about. That's training up a child in the way he should go so that he has something that he's not going to depart from. Not that he's departed from it and somehow miraculously he's just going to come back. So the big lesson, I believe, in Proverbs is that wisdom equals gospel and wisdom equals salvation through Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're training our kids up in. Why should we focus on the salvation of our kids. Well, we as adults, I believe, and kind of go with me here, we, we are so distracted. We are so caught up, and I'm talking to myself too, I catch myself at times, we are so caught up in things that do not matter. And we are so convinced that we are okay in our American cultural Christianity And we convince our kids that because they're pretty good kids that they're okay with Christ. And we wouldn't do that verbally, necessarily. But we get in this mode of thinking like this. We we say, you know, this is an evil, evil world. At least my kid's not as bad as that. Or at at least my child doesn't do the things that I'm seeing on Facebook and on TV. My child is really pretty good compared to most of the other kids in his class. But biblically, every child, every person on the face of this earth has the same need as the next guy and as the next girl. Every person needs salvation through Jesus Christ and forgiveness through Christ. We are all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and our only hope is in Christ. And so many Christian parents never get around to Proverbs 22.6. We'll bring our kids to church... We'll, we'll do some good things for our kids, but do we really train up our child in the way he should go? I think we just assume too much. Christianity has to be a life principle that's lived out day by day. We build our family so many ways and with so many philosophies and so many outlooks on life. And we guide our children by what we say and what we do. They listen and they watch. And we choose how we spend our time and and the conversations we have and the things that we do. And I just want to ask this morning, just a big question, what is the focus of your family? What is the focus of your parenting? Psalm 127, verse 1, another verse you can write down. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those that labor do it in vain. I mean, that's pretty amazing right there. Unless the Lord builds the house... Those who do it labor in vain. I mean, you might labor to raise your children. You might spend time with them, and you might spend doing time doing things that you think are, is right. You, you might spend time trying to help them succeed and make it in the world, and, and they may be active in everything under the sun except for the things of God, and then you decide one day, well, you know, I want to wave a magic wand and hope that they become Christians and add that on top of all the other things that they're doing in life. But what you've done is you've taught them to rely on themselves first to make God a byproduct, just something to add to a list of things that they do. And it's not who they really are. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. And everyone needs regeneration, which means a new heart, to have a covenant with God, a relationship with God. John 1.13 says that Christians are children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's will, but they are born of God. Our kids need to be born of God. That's what they need. Kids need more than just information. Kids need more than just a ride to church on Sunday. They, they need the Word of God, don't they? They need the Gospel. They need it modeled. They need it lived out. They need it fleshed out. With parents who live for Christ and who love Christ, 
1 Corinthians 3, Paul, Paul, the Scripture says that Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God gave the increase. You I mean, parents, you're not ever going to save your kid. Only God can do that. But you can plant and you can water. And, and God can't give increase to something that's not been planted in the first place or to something that's not being watered. And I think that's happened in our culture because... Now what we're seeing are generations of people kind of from my age in the 40s and down who are just longing for simple truth because it's been lost in our culture. We play church, we do all these kind of things with no gospel. And we're just longing for significance and for hope. And you're finding a culture and they don't want church. They're crying out for life change and truth. And they're crying, many of them are crying out for Jesus and they don't even know that they're crying out for Jesus. Did you know that 8 out of every 10 kids who grow up in an evangelical Christian home are now leaving the church by their third year of high school? And why is that? Reality is this. Just because a home has Christian parents or a Christian parent, that doesn't always mean that the child was taught in the way that he or she should go. We've gotten distracted along the way. We've assumed too much. We've convinced ourselves that just because we're Christians that automatically our kids are going to be Christians and their kids are going to be Christians and we're not pointing our kids toward the gospel by the way we live every day, by the conversations we have and by the things that we do and, and, the, and the choices that we make and then we find ourselves with these big long list of I wish I had let's, let's not be at that place church I guess what I'm, I'm saying all this to, in light of Proverbs 22, 6, to just say this, Christian parents, nothing should weigh on our hearts more than our children's salvation. If you're here this morning and you're a parent, let me take it a step further. If you're a parent and you're not sure about your salvation, nothing should weigh more on your heart than your own salvation first. And then the salvation of your kids. Because if you don't have it right, how can your kids ever see it in you? When do the spiritual lives of our children become the most important part of our parenting? That's probably the best question I could ask. When do the spiritual lives of our children, when does that take precedence over everything else in our parenting? Let me give you some biblical principles. Because this says, train up a child in the way he should go, even when he's old and not depart, of, depart from it. What is the way he should go? Well, it's all over the Bible. Let me just give you, give you some. And this is not exhaustive. This is just kind of what God laid on my heart this morning. Number one, I would challenge you as parents, give hands-on instruction. Learn to instruct your kids in the hard things. Teach them to serve by serving them. Teach them to control the tongue by letting them see you control yours. When there is sin, expose it and correct it. Don't let your children ever think that you're perfect, but let them see that you have a perfect Savior. Remember, hope is found in the hands of God. Help them see that they must go to Him. And let them see both sides of God. Don't make God out just to be a gold giver. Don't, don't make Him out. Don't, don't let Him see just the, the generous grace side of God, but let them also see the severity and the wrath of God and how God hates sin. If their gospel is developed by what they watch and what they hear not developed by the Word of God, then they're not getting a biblical worldview. So what I'm saying is give them hands-on instruction and help them see a biblical worldview. Help them see everything in light of the way that Jesus would see it. Secondly, I would say talk about Jesus as much as possible. Bring Jesus into every conversation. Help your children understand that Jesus didn't come for the well, but he came for the sick. He, he came to save those who needed a Savior. Help them, help them see that, that, that Jesus can be a part of every part of their lives. Talk about it. Just like it was in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 9. Here was God had just given Moses the Ten Commandments. And it was basically like Jesus was asking the New Testament, what's the most important commandment? God had, God had said the most important command is to put God first, to love God. 
And it's interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that, that God went on to say this. And he talked about the family. He, listen to this. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And get this, in verse 7 it says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them. That was, that was the point I gave you. Talk about Jesus to your kids. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. That means you're talking about Jesus all the time. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Have conversations about Jesus with your kids. Don't make Christianity out to be some weirdo thing, but talk, help them see and talk to them about it. Help them see that's what they were created for. Number three. I mentioned this in number one, but I want to kind of reiterate it. Be honest with your children about your own sin. I understand you don't tell your kids everything. There's some things they may not understand yet. But be honest with your... Don't ever let your kids think you're perfect. You make mistakes. I make mistakes. We need to let them see that. We need to let them see we have a perfect Savior who forgives us and changes us. You don't ever need to let your kids think that, per, that they're perfect people and that we just zapped into salvation one day. But that we realized we had a need, that we were lost, and we, we needed Christ to save us. That we were hell bound before we realized that the grace of Christ could cover us and save us. Don't, don't, act, don't, don't let your children think you're perfect. 1 John 1 8 says, If we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. In the, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Number four, help your kids see that there's hope in Christ when they fail. If they don't do that, here's the problem. If they don't see that Christ can forgive them, they'll jump into a pattern of do-betterisms throughout their lives. I'll do better the next time, and there'll be no true repentance and no true change. And then they'll feel guilty, and they'll ask God to forgive them, and then there'll be no, no change, and then right back there, three weeks later, four weeks later, right back where they were, uh, just a pattern of do-betterisms, which leads to doubt and fear, and not trust in God that God's bigger than sin, and God can change people. There's no substitute for Christ. Teach them to rely on the gospel. Help your kids know that they can call on Christ when they fail. Because they will fail. And number five, help your kids get this. This is the biggest thing in life. Help your kids see that with Christ, they are getting something from God that they don't deserve. Help them understand grace. Because that's what Christianity is all about. Help them understand that Christ paid the penalty for us. How many of you have told your kids, it's like everybody's going to raise their hand now, how many of you have told your kids to do something and then they didn't do it? Like one guy, like, you know, one guy's telling the truth. Yeah, we've all been there. We probably all were there this morning. Okay. One of my kids is going to children worship, so I'll use him as an example. So I tell my little guy, go, go clean the playroom. Go clean the playroom, and then he doesn't do it. And so Sharon's frustrated. <laughs> she would never be that way, but um, she's frustrated because he didn't do it. And, and, she, and she realizes I told him to do it, and he didn't do it, and we got company coming over. and So she just goes and cleans it anyway. She, and he was supposed to do it. But then I thank Jake for cleaning the room, even though I know that Sharon did it. I, I thank him for doing it. I mean, that wouldn't be fair, would it? It wouldn't be right. I mean, that would, that would, be, that would be a weird thing to do. But here's the thing. Jesus shouldn't have had to die on a cross for us, but he did. He went and cleaned the playroom for us, just like Sharon would have for Jake. See, the God of the universe is not supposed to be crucified on a cross. We need to understand, and our children need to understand, that Jesus took our place and died a death that we deserved. And the only way to know Him is to have a heart change and to trust in Him. And our kids can comprehend that. I think they comprehend it better than we do sometimes. 
In fact, our kids are smarter than fifth graders. I mean, they really are. See, Christianity, knowing Christ, is the best place to be in life because that's what life is. It's what God created us to be. What is a Christian? Can you answer that? And can your kids answer it? You know, we really should plead with them. Let's go ahead and work toward closing out this morning. We're going to close with a song, but I want you to, I want you to listen to this scripture. This is really what we're, what we're working toward. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, listen to this. It's the value of wisdom. It says, My son, if you receive my words and you treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call for insight and you raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. Isn't that what we should long for for our kids, that our kids grow up to fear the Lord and find the knowledge of God? Verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, And from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, and he is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. That's the knowledge I want my kids to have. That's the knowledge that I hope you want your kids to have, but it begins with salvation. Can I pray over us? Father, I come before you, Lord, this morning. And Lord, I pray salvation on this place. Lord, I I pray for parents in this room this morning. Lord, we have come off of an awesome week of kids camp, of, of summer XP. And Lord, we have seen children give their lives to you and embrace you as their Savior. Lord, it's a pretty, pretty awesome thing just to see people transformed. Lord, see people who are lost come to life. But Lord, I I just want to pray for parents this morning. Lord, it doesn't matter if you are six years old or 46 years old. Lord, the scripture says that today is the day of salvation. Lord, in, in 20 years of ministry, I've had the privilege of seeing people that were seven years old and 17 years old and 27 years old and 87 years old come to Christ and realize that that is the most important thing in life. And so, Lord, I pray salvation over this room. I pray you would pour out salvation. I believe there are adults in this room this morning, and they can't answer that question. They don't know if they have a real relationship with you. They don't know if they would go to heaven if their last breath were to come. So, Lord, I pray for salvation to be poured out. Lord, you save people. I can't save anybody. Our staff can't save anybody. Lord, our... Our deacons, our leaders, our teachers, all of our workers and leaders here in the church, we can't save anybody. You are the author of salvation. You draw people to yourself. Lord, we can glorify you and we can talk about you and we can share your word and we can share the gospel with people. But, oh, Lord, I pray you would draw people to you, that your Holy Spirit would work in the lives of people and they would realize their need for you, that there is no greater need in life than to have salvation in Jesus Christ. Your word says no man comes unto the Father unless they come through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is one way to know you, and that is through Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray for salvation. Lord, I pray for believers in this room, Lord, that you would bring revival to our hearts and our souls, God, that you would draw us to the foot of the cross and to our first love. In Christ, Lord, that we would repent of sin, God, and things that are standing in the way of us being who we're called to be. Lord, that we would be a people who are called by your name, that we would humble ourselves and pray, and we would seek your face, O God of Jacob, and that we would cry out and long to be who you've called us to be. Lord, use us to make a difference. Lord, as we sing one more song, as we close out in worship, Lord, let it be a sweet, sweet sound to you, a sweet spirit of worship to you. Lord, we exalt you. We lift you up in this place. We worship you. This is about you. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing with them. If you need to come and pray, come and do that. If you need someone to talk to, we're always here to talk with you, okay?